Torej, upam, da se niste preveč najedli, a ne, da bomo še zdržali skupaj dve sekcije. Čaka naš veliko zanimivih prezentacij. In sicer bomo začeli s Colleen Campbell from Max Planck Digital Library. She will talk about Open Access 2020, achieving a rapid and scholarly orienting transition to Open Access. Please, Colleen. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I'm Colleen Campbell from the Max Planck Digital Library in Germany. I actually live in Italy, so I speak the same language as Nicolò and, and Max from before. But I am American and so my English is pretty good. Now then, um, what will it take to secure open access to today's scholarly journals? Later on in Ignazi's presentation, we will see um, the foster taxonomy of open science. We're here talking about open science. And open access is one piece of that. So um, what I'm going to talk about is one initiative that is advancing open access um, in, in the world today. But I'd like to start out with, um, with, with a piece of text here. I'm going to read it because I think it's very important. Removing access barriers to scholarly and scientific literature will accelerate research, enrich education, share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, make this literature as useful as it can be, and lay the foundation for uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. Do you recognize this text? Do you know it? Yes, <laughs> so, can you tell us what it is? Very good, thank you. The Budapest Open Access Initiative Declaration from 2002. That's when it really all got started, right? So it's time to think back, um, look at our progress so far. Where are we in this quest for open access? What progress have we made in the last 15 years? Well, here you see our paywall, right? The subscriptions that we're paying. We're trying to remove this paywall. And a lot of very important and worthy initiatives have come out in the past 15 years. I'm sure you recognize many of these. Your institutional repositories and disciplinary repositories, things like archive. We have open access mandates that you can um, use to leverage your position. PubMed Central, we have new publishing models that are coming out. But how, how effective have they have been in tearing down the paywall? That is the question. Unfortunately, there's only about 15% of scholarly outputs today are open. 85% are still locked behind paywalls. But perhaps more importantly, the money being invested in the subscription system is very high. If we look at publishing revenues, only 4% are coming from open access publishing. 96% of publishing revenues is dedicated to subscriptions. <coughs> so we have to ask ourselves, what's holding back a large scale shift to open access? Recently, uh, a professor from uh, the Henking School of Economics in Finland, Bo Christer Björk, who uh, studies scholarly publishing, he analyzed the scholarly publishing market using a business tool, Porter's Five Forces Framework, written by a Harvard professor of business back in oh, the late 70s, early 80s. This, um, this tool, Five Forces Framework, is something that's used in, um, in any industry to analyze the level of competition in an industry because the level of competition is ultimately what will make an industry more or less profitable, depending on how much competition there is, okay? So I'm going to take you through uh, Bo Christer Bjork's analysis and looking at the scholarly publishing industry. So the first force that could bring competition into a market is the bargaining power of the suppliers. 
So the suppliers, in our case, are the authors of research. How much pressure are authors putting on the scholarly publishing market? Well, not much, really, because they are actually giving their outputs free to publishers. And um, they serve on editorial boards of journals. You know, they have no real interest in putting pressure on their publishers. The next force that might be at play is the threat of new entrants. So new market entries and examples in scholarly publishing would be things like eLife, SciPost, PLOS, pure open access publishers like Hindawi, etc. And these are all very worthy initiatives, but so far, they too have not been able to make a huge impact on the paywall itself because library budgets are limited right now due to the big deal subscriptions that occupy most of their budgets. And because new open access journals take time to build up reputation. Another possible uh, force in, in creating competition in the market is a threat of substitutes. This might be something like your institutional repositories or media sites like ResearchGate. But so far, these haven't really put much pressure into the market because there are embargo periods that we must deal with. And for the moment, libraries can't rely on freely available copies to substitute completely a subscription. So there's no pressure there. At the center, the fourth competitive force, we have industry rivalry. But if we think about the large commercial publishers right now, let's just, um, as an example, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer Nature, these are uh, very large publishers with diversified portfolios. So a library isn't really in a position to choose one over the other. They are obliged to subscribe to all of them. There's, they don't compete among themselves. And this is a real problem. This 80% of outputs are now in the hands of a small group of publishers who are not competing amongst themselves. So the last competitive force at play <laughs> is the bargaining power of the buyers. In this case, the library consortia or individual institutions. But so far, they have not been putting much pressure on the market. One, because the prices are hidden. We don't know in one country what another country pays for subscriptions. And the pricing isn't, ba isn't um, developed based on the actual cost of publishing but more on the, the concept of what can the market bear and based on historic print expenditures that really don't have any place in a digital landscape. So all of these five forces in scholarly publishing have very little power to change the current system. They're holding scholarly publishing in a deadlock. Um, keeping, us, uh, keeping us behind the paywall while a small group of publishers extract very high profit margins. We've seen prices have increased around 60% in the past 10 years, and that's not accounting for fluctuation in exchange rates either. I know in the UK, <laughs> Brexit, what has that meant to their pricing, for example? So, this is our paywall, still as strong and as high as ever. So is, is it possible then? Will we stay locked in this situation forever? Is a, a shift of today's scholarly publishing possible to open access? We think it is possible. I come from the Max Planck Digital Library and my colleagues wrote a paper two years ago um, that you might have uh, heard about and this is a graphic um, extracted from that paper illustrating the market today. So you see up at the top on the left, the current subscription market, we're paying around 7.6 billion euro for subscriptions. Now if we just take that amount 
and we divide it by the number of articles in those journals, of which is two million, we come out with an average expense of 3,800 euro per article. But let's think a moment. What would it look like in an open access world where we don't pay for access, but we pay publishers for their work in publishing? I mean, we heard Nicolas before uh, describing all of the amazing services that they are offering to authors. We, publishers serve a purpose. University <laughs> presses serve a purpose. They're providing services to their users, and that service has a cost. So we don't want to, no one's saying publishing is free. Publishing has a cost. So let's take a very um, conservative estimate of 2,000 euro per article charge. You might call this an APC, but this, I'm not saying that 2,000 euro article processing charge is the right thing to aim for. This is just a unit of measure for the moment. If we take that amount, multiply it by our 2 million articles, we come out with a very different total expenditure with a buffer that could be used for other, <coughs> other open science and open access initiatives. If I were to ask you, what is power? Some might say, well, knowledge is power. But if you really think hard in today's society, where does the power lie? The power lies in money, ultimately. Money. Sorry? Money talks. Money talks, right. So um, the initiative that I'm representing today thinks we need to focus our efforts in addition to all of the other open access initiatives, we need to focus our efforts on the money. We need a mandate for our money. We need to make strategic decisions with our subscription budgets. So I don't know how, how familiar you are with Open Access 2020. It all started at the 12th Berlin Open Access Conference a couple years ago. Um, the, the participants at that conference developed a document called the expression of interest. And this is the foundation here. We have, um, there have been many calls, many statements and guidelines, but this expression of interest aims to be um, an action plan, okay? We want to actually have a strategic plan to shift um, the market away from subscriptions and to open access. And here we have the, the, the basic statement. We aim to transform a majority of today's journals from subscription to OA publishing in accordance with community-specific publishing preferences. That means there might be local contexts in which um, publishing might not necessarily be with a large commercial publisher. It might not be based on APCs. There are many different publishing initiatives and business models to be explored. But the point is we have to take the money away from subscriptions. And it's signing the document is showing a commitment to making your best effort to sh shift the resources you currently spend on journal subscriptions to support sustainable OA business models. So it's it's initiative about action. The, the, the expression of interest, this document has been signed by over 90 organizations, many of them national library consortia, from all over the world, South Africa, Brazil, uh, throughout Europe, and now most recently by a number of libraries in China. And I think this is very significant that China is finally really getting involved in the open access movement in this way. And I believe it's because they see it as an opportunity to be part of scholarly communications of the future. That 80% of outputs that I mentioned before with that small group of large commercial publishers, those publishers are located in the West. So I think China has felt very much isolated from the, the, the scholarly publishing discourse. In an open access world, China sees for themselves a, a more prominent place at the table that will be scholarly communications. The initiative has received also endorsement from the research community. And of course, researchers on one hand, it seems to be they, they are sometimes a little bit schizophrenic because they, very, they like the idea of open access, but at the same time, they like their journals. 
Um, so Open, OAC, Open Access 2020 is um, taking rather a neutral stance on this. We're, it's an opportunity to partner with publishers in the transformation, thereby allowing the researchers to have their traditional journals, while in the meantime, other publishing initiatives are growing. So more recently, um, at the last Berlin conference, supporting that initial document that I showed you before, they've created a, a stronger initiative that, that I, I represent personally. So this is our website, oa2020.org. I encourage you to, to visit the site and explore it. It aims to be um, a resource where you can find information about what's happening in other contexts around the world in this um, in this uh, transition, in the, in, in, as libraries carry out an action plan. And one of the, the key points is the, a roadmap, an OA 2020 roadmap. So I'm going to walk you through some of the steps that um, might be helpful as you think about how you can make impact and moving away from subscriptions and toward open access. So first step. Understand your position. Understand what leverage power you might have um, with regard to your subscriptions. Of course, you need backing from your university rectors, your, the, the research funders, the ministries, whoever it is that is ultimately paying for the subscription access. Then you can develop a transformation strategy, divesting of subscriptions, shifting your resources to open access publishing models, and then hopefully collaborate with the community at large. So I'm going to give a few examples of, of these steps. First of all, um, assessing your leverage, assessing your own power. When uh, the, year, the, the year approaches its end, you might go to a publisher and ask him, could you send me the renewal offer? And the publisher might send a renewal offer with, I don't know, a percentage increase in cost and maybe some usage statistics to illustrate how important his content is to your researchers. But in the open access 2020 um, logic, we need to think broader than usage and access. We need to think about publishing as part of the relationship with a publisher. So not only look at usage and access, let's look where our researchers are actually publishing. What journals are important to them? What works are they citing in their articles? So at the Max Planck Digital Library, we did this exercise and we found, this, this is a, a result. We've seen that publication in open access journals is growing and actually, if I look at those big three, the three biggest commercial publishers, their share of our publication is, is going down. That puts me in a different bargaining position. If I can say, all right, you have usage, but I have publication data, citation data, which tells very much the same story. So maybe you need to tell me why I should renew my subscription under the same terms. Next, of course, you need to think about, um, excuse me, right, it's important here, I said before, we're bringing together the concept of access and publishing together so that the relationship an institution has with a publisher comprises both. Looking at publishing in the, among the, in the world today, you will see that in the top 20 journals by publishing output, eight that eight of those journals are pure gold OA journals. That shows to me that the relevance of subscription journals is declining. So assessing your leverage power, of course you need um, to make cost considerations. Again, this is an exercise that we did within Germany where the library is located and so if we think back to that 2,000 euro article processing charge that I mentioned before, well, first of all, um, I have to think how many articles are published from my country in a year? And so that's the top column in gray 
for Germany over the past years. Mm -hmm. But of course, any given country wouldn't be responsible for paying all of the publishing costs, only those costs associated with the corresponding author. So you see that's around um, somewhere between, well, around 60 and 70 percent, right? So that's a much smaller number to work with. And then we need to think about what does it truly cost? We need to decide what do we consider a fair article processing charge, for example. 2,000 euro would have one total cost, but 1,300 is quite a different article processing charge. And there is a resource, I don't know if you're familiar with, OpenAPC. Have you seen the website, OpenAPC? OK. There, institutions are uploading information about the publishing charges being paid by their researchers. And it's a, it's a growing body of evidence that we can use to understand the actual cost of publishing. That um, 1,300 per article charge is what is currently paid today by uh, Max Planck researchers on average. So it's not 2,000 euro. Now, we said we needed, um, besides understanding our leverage, the next step, we need to obtain backing from our institutions. And here, guidelines, um, like the ones that Lieber has, that uh, Wilhelm mentioned before, guidelines um, can, can become very important. They can empower you with a framework to work within when you are creating your own plan. These are just a few very important guidelines. The next step, once you've obtained backing, is to create your own transformation strategy. Looking at all of the publishers you are currently um, paying for subscription access and thinking about how you can change that expenditure. Maybe it's implementing a stepwise reduction, reducing your expenditures by a certain percentage every year to reuse those funds in open access. At the Max Planck Library and in um, a number of other northern European countries, they have chosen the, the strategy of negotiating transitional agreements, offsetting agreements. We'll hear in a moment um, from Carolyn. In the UK, they were um, the pioneers of uh, the agreements. And we can all learn from their experiences and push beyond the offset model into read and publish models and even beyond after that. We could just simply engage in subscription reviews and analyze with that new information, publication data, citation data, how much value is a big deal subscription really giving my institution and think about stepping away from them and going to individual subscriptions only when really important to my researchers. On, on this, uh, uh, down below, you'll see we've just um, linked out to a number of open access strategies that are in place around the world. It's just a sampling, and we hope to include more. So if you have a strategy um, for divesting of subscriptions and investing in open access, I hope you'll share it so we can include it. The next step is to invest in open access. So promote pure open access journals. With any cost savings that you can obtain, invest in a university press. Invest in your institutional repositories. Support new publishing models. And here down below, I've shown you some examples of transitional models of publishing in which knowledge unlatched. I hope you're familiar with some of these. Um, SciPost, Scope 3, all different examples of how you can transition. So again, um, getting back to the Max Planck Digital Library, which is just one roadmap, um, we analyzed our own publication data and found that our researchers publish 80% of their articles with 20 publishers. Five of these are already pure open access publishers. So if I'm a librarian thinking, wow, to negotiate a whole strategy to shift away from subscriptions to open access, that's a big job. But here I see already that it's not such a big job. We're not talking about hundreds of publishers, but just 15, actually. <clears throat> Already in 2017, we have three transitional agreements in place with Taylor and Francis, RSC, and, and uh, Springer Compact. So we are looking to, as, new, um, as renewal 
of uh, renewal periods come around, as our agreements um, expire, we are looking to inject open access entitlements into our agreements so that the research, uh, excuse me, the, the publishing that's already happening um, is incorporated into one agreement, access and publishing. So our goal is to have all of our major agreements by 2020 in a transformational mode. That's a huge a goal, but I think it's important to have lofty goals, something to work for. We might not reach it, but at least we have an action plan and are doing something actively about it. I will, uh, because um, I think it was, um, uh, someone asked me the, the other day about the deal negotiations. You might have heard about them. That's another representation of um, a, of a country that is looking to incorporate open access publishing and access in a single agreement. And right now they are negotiating with three biggest publishers. Um, yeah, and we'll see how they go. My, my, the anecdotal knowledge that I have is that Wiley and Springer Nature are open and so the negotiations, negotiations are continuing in a positive light. Elsevier uh, not as much, if I can say that very delicately. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but already at the end of 2016, around, I think it was 90 universities in Germany did not have access to Elsevier content anymore. And at the end of 2017, unless, um, unless an agreement is reached, which does not look likely at this point, another hundred or so institutions will also not have access to Elsevier content. And I think it's very admirable, this strong commitment in Germany to, um, to open access. And let's, let's be honest and face the facts here. In a negotiation strategy, stepping away from the table is a viable option today. You might have seen the, the graphic on the right, you might have seen this article by Jason Freem, um, and Heather Pibowar showing just how much content is available today openly. And I think we as libraries need to um, investigate these options and start adopting tools like OADOI, OneFinder, and incorporating them into our systems so that we can connect our researchers to open access content more easily. <clears throat> Then of course, there is the Sci-Hub question. What does Sci-Hub tell us? What does this phenomenon tell us? Here you see a graphic, again, from an article published last year um, when Sci-Hub released data showing where the downloads are coming from. So we see here in the United States, all of these downloads from Sci-Hub occurring across institutions that actually had licensed access to the content that they were downloading. What does this tell us? It tell us, tells us that our researchers are expressing their choice. They want simple, open access. They just want to get to that content and they have the expectation that it's open. My own children, you know, <laughs> YouTube, it's open. You just go, it's there, right? This is the expectation of 21st century researchers. This needs to be um, a wake-up call, not only to the publishers, but to libraries. With all of these access options that we have now, with the phenomenon of SciHub, it really looks like not only publishers, but also libraries with our subscription budgets that we continue to invest in paywalled access. We are propping up a system that is dysfunctional. It's based on print publication um, organization and scholarly dissemination. Today, we have a completely new world in front of us. So we need to think about continuing to invest in that system that's outdated and dysfunctional. OA 2020 is about collective action. As here you have a view of the countries um, of, of where we have institutions and organizations that have signed the expression of interest and who have committed to shifting their resources to open access away from subscriptions. And truly, we saw before that it's really 20 commercial publishers 
that hold the scholarly communications market in a deadlock, that's something that's um, manageable. If we work together, sharing our, um, our, our roadmaps and all working in the same direction, I'm confident we are going to get there in 2020. So I invite you all to think about it. It's time to unplug the paywall system. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. It was very, very interesting. And uh, the questions will be possible in the end of the session. So we will continue with uh, our sponsor Pro uh, from ProQuest, uh, Eva Zigildi. Yeah. Where is the... No, I need the, uh -huh. the presentation. So. This is yes. Thank you very much for staying on for a while. My name is Eva Ceglidi and I'm coming from ProQuest, which is an aggregator. So probably you will not hear similar uh, approach like open access and so on because we don't publish anything. But we are happy to aggregate whatever the, the clever publishers or the universities putting together scholarly journals uh, make available. Mm -hmm. Today I will talk about open science in a way that uh, if the researchers get really tired, probably they will let normal people go and check what the scientific uh, literature provide them. And instead of sitting in the ivory tower, uh, we are trying to introduce a content which would uh, attract the new generation or the present generation of scientists to do something differently. So uh, I will talk rather about citizen science, which can contribute at the end to the uh, scientific uh, results uh, globally. Very simply, just a short word uh, or a couple of words about ProQuest so that you see who uh, I come from, uh, what our approach is to electronic resources as our uh, richest uh, content type, and then I will talk about the Visual History Archive, which is a sort of novelty here, and I would like to call your attention to that. I'm sure all of you have heard of ProQuest, and I know that uh, uh, some of you actively use some of our contents like the dissertation collections or ebook uh, subscriptions or ebooks. Uh, the thing is that uh, as we have been growing since uh, the birth of the company, nowadays there are two elements of the company, the softwares on the uh, red part, uh, which includes uh, the library systems, web discovery, and so on, uh, and the contents which can be either print books or electronic resources, databases, dissertation, statistics, ebooks. Uh, I'm sure you've heard, but let me just express again that uh, through merges and acquisitions, now Ex Libris belongs to the ProQuest family and Alexander Street belongs to the ProQuest family as well. So that's why you could uh, remember my colleague Scrassi's presentation in the morning. And then if we uh, work with a lot of uh, different types of contents, let me just highlight why we think that uh, certain elements are really important and why we add certain elements. 
Uh, in every two or three years, we try to survey our customers, the libraries and the researchers, what kind of content they use and what kind of content they suggest to their uh, students to use. And uh, uh, earlier this year, there was a survey. We asked uh, more than 400 researchers and lecturers what uh, content type they use. Obviously, journals are number one, so that's why journals are not uh, on, the, on the slide. But then you can see that print books, books are still very strong. 80% of them are using that latest thinking, like dissertations, working papers are getting really strong. And the good thing is that there are uh, changing uh, patterns in research uh, reflecting the generation change, changes as well. So that's why if we go down a little bit, you may recall that new content types like e-books and videos are getting really strong. Uh, I took this slide as a comparison from a, a survey a couple of years ago from 2014, yeah, when e-books were used by about 70% of the uh, researchers, now it's 80. But I think it's more strikely or more striking to see the, the usage of videos. Uh, four years ago it was less than 40%, now it's 71%. Yeah, as uh, Colin was mentioning YouTube is something to go to, and uh, I'm sure all nation has uh, uh, a specific local, national type of YouTube. So we know that uh, YouTube and the, the video streams are really important and uh, uh, interesting. That's why Alexander Street is getting bigger and bigger, bigger with the uh, different subscriptions or, or purchase video collections. But now I would like to call your attention to a very special video collection which is not available on YouTube, and this is the Visual History Archive. Uh, the name uh, talks for itself, so we will see pictures, it will be about history, and it's a lot, and it's coming back to the history or, or the background, so it's an archive. But uh, if we, we want to be very serious, it's a very rich and very uh, important source for studying not only history and genocides, but all sort of uh, psychological, educational, moral questions, which are really reflecting in our lives, uh, in our da uh, daily lives nowadays. So first of all, this collection was uh, put together at the beginning uh, in the 90s by about uh, by uh, uh, Spielberg who started to film Schindler's List and uh, to make the film more factual he decided to have interviews to look for and have interviews with the uh, witnesses and survivors of the Holocaust and of, of course 20 years ago it was easier for him to find uh, these people and uh, at the end they uh, with, with his colleagues, they started to put together a pattern of questions. So everyone was asked uh, using, using the same uh, set of questions. And uh, finally, they made about 51,000 interviews. And you can imagine that at the beginning, they just used the videotapes. And then when they didn't have enough space for the videos, they decided to make it, uh, uh, to digitize that. And then uh, that was the way how the uh, uh, collection was put together. And finally, uh, uh, Spielberg was donating the, the collection to the University of South California's, uh, California's uh, Shoah Foundation. So uh, they uh, chose ProQuest to uh, make it available for more uh, libraries in the world. And of course, university libraries can be interested in using that, but public libraries can learn a lot because I will show you some examples. I will uh, tell you what kind of uh, researches or results you can get. The local history is very important. And we see that the local history uh, is not easy to, to get taught to the next generation. But if, if they see, if they uh, can imagine that in their street or in their town, what has happened and uh, whose family members were involved in certain things, uh, they get uh, more interested, they get more enthusiastic, and probably they will be the, the future researcher generation as well. So uh, the Visual History Archive in figures uh, is about 50, 
54 and a half thousand interviews. The uh, most uh, covered topic is Holocaust or Shoah, rather, with uh, over 51,000 uh, interviews with survivors or witnesses or aiders. Uh, Obviously, it's complete first-person histories, and the history or the interview uh, in all cases are uh, indexed. We use uh, 64,000 terms, and it's not only indexed in a way that uh, you can get uh, to approximately uh, the, the speech when the, the term is, uh, is uh, spoken, but there are two ways. First of all, every minute is uh, uh, indexed. So when we make a search for a, a term, we will get to the minute where it was uh, uh, told. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the index terms are a little bit broader than what we learned from Tesaurus, because if they if we make a search for starvation, we will get the results when they talk about we didn't have enough food, our family was running out of food, and that sort of things. So uh, we, or actually the foundation was really thorough in, in indexing and in uh, elaborating the, the content. And then some figures, uh, what is included, beside the genocides at Holocaust, it includes uh, the Armenian genocides, drunk, Nanjing massacre, the genocides in Rwanda against the Tutsis, yes, Guatemala and Cambodian, uh, uh, like crime against uh, or war crime against uh, humanity, and uh, finally. It's not only interviews. One interview is about two and a half hours long, so you may think that it's too long. But uh, every interview, as I've told you, is indexed by segments. Secondly, every interview has three uh, uh, elements. One is covering uh, things before the war, at 38. The next one is from 38 to f uh, 45, so actually covering the war, and then how their life was uh, going on after the war. So it's a really, it's a collection of lives, and uh, it's a collection of uh, first-person histories uh, uh, in the Visual History Archive. And as I've told you, it can be used in education, psychology, linguistics. For example, the uh, for, uh, USA Shoah Foundation has a network, and uh, based on the collection, this network in Europe and in the US as well make uh, uh, like uh, walks in, in towns and in cities which are really targeting the high school students, and during these walks, uh, the uh, different places which are mentioned at the, at the collection can be explored, and uh, uh, not only the local history and personal stories can be taught, but uh, child or uh, pupils can learn about the global events and the history at the end. So I try to make some relevance and some relevant searches for Slovenia, because why would you be interested in a global collection if there is no anything uh, about Slovenia here? And uh, I made a search for Slovenia as such. And of course, I got into the situation when Slovenia is really tricky because finally uh, that's a new uh, state uh, since uh, uh, 1990. So first when I made a search, a quick search for Slovenia, I got 45 uh, 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 interviews with different people. And then I saw that maybe I can find more, and maybe I should be clever, cleverer a bit. And instead of just making a quick search, I try to use uh, the uh, place search so that I can uh, point out some of the relevant uh, cities and settlements in Slovenia. And you can see that in the end, I got uh, this map, which uh, shows uh, the settlements with the interviews and the interview numbers uh, mentioning or originating from that settlement. So uh, you can see that finally Slovenia has some memories uh, in, the, in the collection. Uh, so when I made the search, I got the list. And uh, I was trying to check what kind of uh, interviews I can have. Uh, 
obviously it's like a normal result list with the uh, with the different elements of like metadata and i clicked on one uh, trying to figure out what's going on and you can see that choosing one interview would show the interview itself but you will have a lot of extra information uh, next to it so you can see the map uh, and the finally the global map is pointing out the places which were important uh, in the life of this lady you can see in the middle that uh, the segments are selected where Ljubljana was mentioned I clicked on a, on a Ljubljana related uh, interview uh, I saw that this lady is uh, a Slovenian lady Lisa de, Kurt, de Curtis let's say that's the right way to pronounce but uh, it's a lovely love story at the end because she was telling that when she was young she fell in love with a Slovenian young guy and that's why she uh, got to to Ljubljana so you can see that all sort of uh, uh, connections can be uh, and relevances can be explored by the uh, collection next I try to f find another interview where uh, probably the interviewed person is Slovenian and I'm trying to go through I don't know escape. yeah escape okay yes and I found Margareta Fisse uh, and she uh, started to talk about her life and again uh, <coughs> under the screen I could check uh, some facts from her uh, biography and it is saying that she was born in Maribor so it's probably this lady is uh, Slovenian actually she was telling that her mother is Slovenian her father is Serbian and uh, she was born in, in uh, Maribor but then uh, they were moved because of the new job of his father they were moved to Ljubljana and uh, during the war uh, Ljubljana was occupied by the Italians and at the beginning they saw that would be the worst thing ever but finally that saved their life because the Germans occupied the Serb areas and then the uh, father's family um, finally got lost uh, during that time uh, again it's interesting to mention that uh, this lady was speaking in English so uh, the interview was taken uh, in English in the US probably but she made available a lot of pictures so during the collection you can only you can uh, see not only the interview itself but uh, all sorts of uh, material or, or uh, visual tools which help you uh, understand and and imagine the situation more so she showed a couple of pictures of uh, themselves and the family and you can see that uh, the segments are still relevant and the segments are revealed here too and uh, you can see that not only her bi uh, biography can be seen but her family members can be explored and again it goes back to local history it goes back to a to a student let's say who find it interesting to see what's happened with my family with the neighbor's family and it's something really thrilling uh, to like face the present generation let's say uh, with the with the history through the pictures and uh, not only from a quite dry uh, history book actually there are about 700,000 family names indexed so i'm sure uh, the the research researchers can find it really uh, rich and and like an endless pool of information besides the uh, 700,000 uh, oh, actually sorry I was wrong that's why I needed my my notebook so 1.85 million family names were man, uh, mentioned and indexed and 712,000 uh, uh, pictures are indexed as well so you can make a search in that and uh, since uh, there are memories uh, from that time in the collections as well there are about 2100 musical recitals so either uh, a song or a score from that time which is scanned 
uh, and there are some other testimonies uh, with recitals, like a poem, uh, yeah, a poem from that time written by uh, by someone to the family, and so on. So finally, uh, after uh, checking the uh, interviews. Uh, taken in uh, in English about Slovenia, uh, I decided to check what we can find in Slovenian language as well. And then I made a search for uh, Slovenian language. You can, yeah, again. Uh, you can make searches uh, based on language as well, and then I find uh, I found the the Slovenian language uh, interviews. The interviews uh, most of the times, or or in in majority, were taken with the Jewish uh, survivors, but uh, rescuers and aid uh, aid uh, providers were interviewed as well, liberators, or. Uh, not uh, or, or not Jewish, but other victims of the Second World War, like uh, Sinti and Roma survivors, political prisoners, homosexual uh, uh, survivors, or even the Je uh, Jehovah Witness survivors. So it's it's a really wide uh, uh, coverage uh, of the of the victims at the time. It's important to mention, though, that the the soldiers or the the uh, so the bad guys weren't interviewed, and that was an intentional uh, move and an intentional decision to make uh, the the survivors and and witnesses uh, uh, thoughts uh, public and not the not the other side. And finally, among the uh, Slovenian uh, interviews, I've selected one, and this will go to the marketing, to the more commercial part of my presentation. Sorry <laughs> about it. Uh, one lady, had a Cox, started to talk about uh, he, uh, her life at the time. And again, under the screen, you can find different uh, uh, facts about her life, about his, uh, sorry, uh, about her family, uh, names, what she mentioned. And uh, besides that, we um, try to make researchers' life easier. And that's why we make uh, ProQuest contents uh, like available in a in a way like a, a, a teaser for a, or a trailer for a movie. So when she talks about uh, a global event or a, or, a, or an event which is uh, described either in a scholarly journal or an article, which ProQuest uh, has uh, in in in. Anyway, uh, we try to uh, cont uh, link these uh, background information, these articles, to the uh, interview. So here you can see that uh, she was uh, mentioning some, some, something. I think about, yeah, about the Balkans uh, and and Ljubljana. So we linked uh, those articles, which are either from. Uh, journals or from our archives about uh, the, the same topic again. And then uh, I just pointed out one relevant content type, which is a dissertation about the topic she mentioned. And uh, that's a good occasion for me to tell you that don't forget you have the dissertation database available in, in Slovenia. So you could see that simply clicking on educators and attitudes, the dissertation itself, the uh, link goes to the uh, dissertation itself, so uh, you will get uh, several results at the same time. But again, if we uh, had uh, gone back to the uh, other uh, sources, I was just uh, showing some article uh, from uh, uh, our journal uh, collections or from our uh, archives, historical newspaper archives or from the New York Times archives. So finally, uh, that that is the database or this collection itself. And uh, as I've told you, the usage is demanded not by, uh, not necessarily by the researchers or by scientists alone, but it can come from uh, young people or, or teachers at high schools who would like to show the, the 
human reflection of global events what we encounter. So that was about the uh, visual history archive. Thank you very much. And let me just have one, one, uh, yeah. One commercial part again. I was collecting some names because we have some drawings like a lottery. <laughs> maybe, maybe that will bring uh, luck for someone. And uh, as uh, uh, it's becoming a, a history for us to have uh, a power bank uh, from ProQuest, to re so that someone can remember ProQuest name later on. So I will just throw who is the lucky winner. This one. And this is Martina Frelich from the University of Ljubljana. Is she here? Is, is someone who can hand over? <laughs> Next one? Okay. Yeah. No? Shall I? You? No? <laughs> Miran Petak. Miran, where are you? Miran. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Miran Petak. I know from his own. Okay, so let's draw another one and then at least we have some fun at the end. You see, next time you have to sit along here. Yeah. Gaspar Lesnik. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Thank you very much and sorry for the fun part. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Eva. Uh, we will continue with uh, Caroline Alderson, uh, Deputy Director for GIS Collections, with the title The Development of Consortial Approaches to Open Access in the UK. Okay, thanks very much, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. So I'm Caroline Alderson from GIS Collections. And my talk is, as we've just heard, the development of consortial approaches to open access in the UK. Now, these slides really have been put together by my colleague, Liam Ernie, who spoke at two of the um, events that, that have just um, gone, gone by. So, same slides, but probably different talk. I'm not really sure, because I don't know quite what Liam said. Um, so, I don't speak Italian, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, speak English. <laughs> so, the agenda really for my talk is just support for open access. It's about our experience of open access on our negotiations and how that's developed. I'm going to talk about uh, the current status of negotiations, what the sort of progress to date, where we are now. Then about the challenge that we face, um, probably alluding to things that Colleen has really um, talked about, the changing attitudes towards open access agreements in the UK. Really, you know, starting off very optimistic, moving to pessimism and, and skepticism, and then looking at the evolving approach to our negotiations. So this, I'm starting with this infographic because I want to set the scene for what I'm talking about really. GIS Collections is um, here in this infographic and if you see it falls under acceptance. So the whole infographic is about the research publication life cycle. Apologies, it doesn't quite fit perfectly on the slide. Um, but it's starting um, really with submission going through to acceptance, publication and use. And where GIS Collections fits in here is around managing costs at the point of acceptance. And it links in also with Monitor UK, which is about APC expenditure and collecting that data, and also around guidance and consultancy, technical support and OA good practice. So 
Um, I mean, ju just to say really that probably until about four or five years ago, in terms of GIST support for open access, GIST collections wasn't in this picture at the time. It has really developed because of the mandates in the UK and the changes that that's brought. Ah, so my focus. So the change really in the UK government policy concerning open access has resulted in almost an immediate, resulted in almost an immediate change in the expectations of GIST collections. And uh, we were quick to appreciate that challenge and, and to step up to it. And at the time we called the challenge the total cost of ownership because we knew that we were facing the difficulty of bringing subscriptions and paying for APCs together. And as I say, it was very much driven by government policy. And so over the last few years, we have really immersed ourselves um, in the groups that are working with the policymakers and the universities um, and the publishers, all of those players really that are affected by the change to try and just focus on, it's focusing on the UK about what's happening and how we can manage this. And so the groups that we have a representation on, um, the first one there is the Universities UK Open Access Coordination Group. And, and that really, it doesn't have um, a decision-making mandate as such, but it's about bringing all those players together to talk about the efficiencies, the standards, the re things that we need to do around repositories and the technologies and monographs. And so there are subgroups in place and we have representation on those groups as well. So Liam is on the main, my, my colleague Liam Murney, who spoke um, previously um, at this roadshow event, um, he is on the UK Open Access Coordination Group. And my colleague Anna Vernon is on the efficiencies group. She provides the secretariat. Um, she is also on the Research Libraries UK Open Access, uh, Open Access Publisher Processes group. And that group is really looking at, the, they're at the coalface dealing uh, the libraries who are having to deal with open access on a daily basis and what that means for them. I've been on the Research Councils UK Open Access Practitioners Group, so that's a group really led by the research councils in the UK, drawing together the libraries and some other parties like JISC who represent the community to actually look at the mandate as it is and to see how that can be developed, not, not developed in terms of changing what the mandate is, but what the actual issues are around understanding the mandate and how can the, the FAQs be made much more clear um, around what, what each thing means. And, and actually that, you know, that was quite surprising to find out how much people didn't understand aspects of, of the, the mandate uh, at, at a local level in universities. And we also have a presence uh, on these European groups as well, which again represent policy. So over the past few years, we have um, really, as, as I say, immersed ourselves in working with the various groups to see how we can progress open access in the UK. And we have um, GIST, represent, GIST collections represents around 160 to 70 UK universities in our consortium. And we have, over the past years, tried to address the issue of moving towards open access, transitioning in that direction by licensing and negotiation activities. So we've been looking at the pure gold open access. We've been, um, as we'll hear a bit more, the hybrid offsetting agreements. Also green open access, which has probably come along probably more in the last year or so. Um, when there has been more of an understanding from the um, funders that, yeah, green is, is more okay than we perhaps thought about initially. So our work it covers journals and monographs, and we're aiming at constraining costs, supporting the transition to open access, bringing efficiencies by working for the whole of the consortium and helping them in what they do, 
ensuring that we can um, bring about what needs to be done in terms of promoting compliance. I'll say a bit more about that later. And also supporting the development of a functioning marketplace to actually how this works. So examples of our current negotiations, looking at pure gold agreements, uh, we have agreements in place, as we, we heard before from Colleen, as Hindawi and Biomed Central, PRJ, also Ubiquity Press. Um, these are publishers that are very much um, moved to the open access, uh, who want to be make themselves known and develop what they have to offer, but they are really quite small in the broad context of what's going on. We've also got agreements in place with the Open Library of Humanities and Open Book Publishers as well, so it's not only about the journals. We've also um, been involved for, for a number of years with what I would call Open Access Consortium Initiatives, um, they are perhaps broader than the UK, they're looking out, they're looking at the global context and trying to, to move in that direction. And the UK, JISC isn't actually doing the negotiations as such here, what we're doing is participating in the initiatives and in a way I see it more as negotiating with our community in fact. I mean it has helped us to understand the difficulties of moving, of getting everybody on the same page to do something global, particularly with the scope three is the example there. All the difficult, you know, having an idea of where you want to go and then each country involved needing to do what they need to do locally and what they're doing locally isn't the same. Um, and that relates to how things are funded locally, um, how many um, institutions are involved, um, what the subscription expenditure was, um, how much publishing output there is in each country. All those variables have had an impact and, and moving from subscriptions to open access for effectively, I suppose, seven or eight journals, high energy physics, it's actually been really, really time consuming, but very much giving an understanding of the lessons around moving to a global model and what that model might look like. Um, the Reveal Digitals um, at the bottom there, that's, uh, we don't, just doesn't get so much funding in the way that we used to. We used to buy content or digitize content through funding initiatives that we get, but now, we're looking at different ways of how we can help to digitize new content. And we have recently, my colleague Paola Marconi has been, she speaks Italian. Um, she has been uh, working with Reveal Digital um, on independent voices resource to, to digitize new content. And we have been working with our community to find out how that can be crowdsourced to get uh, that open resource available. But it involves, obviously, nothing comes for free. Something has to be paid. But it is quite interesting that the new initiatives, there is much more buoyancy around those than the journals thing. So coming up to the journals, um, we have also negotiated agreements with a gold open access component. Uh, we might call these the hybrid uh, journals. So we have... Um, with BMJ, various models actually across all of these journals, whether it's a prepayment model or a membership model, whether it's a straight discount on APCs, whether we're looking, say, with the Royal Society of Chemistry at a read and publish model that's just an option, one of um, three or four that we have with the Royal Society. Not everybody within our 150 universities consortium want to go there yet. So that's another thing to think about. How do you bring everybody along together to transition? We have um, also with SAGE, that's um, highly discounted APCs. And then Springer Nature is uh, the flipped model. So paying to publish and gaining access but interestingly not all of our universities opt into that. So depending on how they manage their open access locally and their APCs and how they need to report and do that locally means they may not 
really be using that deal in the way that we anticipated? And why, why is that? You know, so the local policies have an impact on how quickly you can move in the direction of the full transition. And with Taylor and Francis and Wiley, we were hoping that perhaps for n by next year we would have moved to agreements that are, I mean, again, they're called, Wiley call it a blended model. Um, Taylor and Francis, we might call it um, a pay to publish model. So with Springer Nature, it's the flipped model. You know, so actually coming to consent, are they all different? Or are they actually the same model? Uh, they're all slightly different. <laughs> so we didn't get there um, this year, but we didn't because for one, for an example with Taylor and Francis, we didn't have enough what we, we thought of as absolutely accurate details around APCs. Um, for prior years. So this issue of actually understanding the publishing output is really important to be able to make decisions about whether moving to this new model is really going to make sense for everybody. But there has been progress. I don't, didn't want that to sound totally negative. Um, but it's not surprising in a way. Here's an example of the growth in APCs from 2013 through to 2016 for 10 institutions and showing the growth from 2013 to 2016. And this was work done by a colleague, Katie Shamash, um, to see how that growth has grown in the UK from the UK authors. Not surprisingly, it, I mean, we would expect that to see that kind of growth in the knowledge that uh, the Research Council mandate does expect authors to publish more open access each year. So we're seeing a curve, that's a trend that's going up that does reflect an expectation of more and more open access publishing. It's not totally clear, or, you know, if, we ha if there was no funding, the funders provide a block grant to research intensive universities, they receive some funding. It's just not clear if they didn't receive the funding whether we would be looking at that kind of trend. I, I personally don't think so. I don't think it would have gone up to the same extent. And in the sample of 38 UK institutions in the reports, um, the combined value of the offset agreements that we've done with publishers so far is um, bring savings of about 5.5 million. And we can extrapolate that the total value of the same agreements for 2016, because we haven't actually done that, is an estimated 8 million. And if you're looking in a very loose way at the expectations of the research councils, expectation of 75% compliance rate of publishing in open access for 2017-18, we might see that figure is going to be over 10 million. And this diagram here shows um, the number of journals. Uh, this is looking at 11 in research, in research intensive institutions from 2013 to 2016 for the growth of pure gold open access. And you see the, the trend is going up. So it's full open access, the bottom line, and hybrid journals open access, which we can see is higher. There was a dip. I think the dip is to do with the research excellent framework exercise. Everybody was publishing like mad up to that date, and then there was a little bit of a tail, and now it's picked up again. So part of what we've been doing um, through these agreements that we've um, negotiated, offset agreements and discounted APCs and working with Elsevier, for example, in, in our renewal of that agreement, is to really understand more about the service level agreements that are required now. Again, Colleen alluded to those, that when you actually bring in the open access side, you have to think about, well, hang on a minute, we need to check this and this, we need to have some mechanism for collecting information about APCs and ensuring that things happen when they're meant to. So 
service level agreements are something we, we didn't do and now we're doing, um, we're, we're really establishing that. Also, the read and publish models, um, they are now developing, I'll say a bit more later. And the workflows for APCs and for authors, those are things we were just sitting down with Wiley uh, the other week and you know we need to understand the workflows. These are things, it was a bit simpler maybe three years ago, but now we're seeing the workflows um, have become more complex. So we need to get clarity on that. This is part and parcel of the negotiation now. And the same for all the other publishers too. I just mentioned Wiley as the example. So we can see through those graphs that you know, there is an awful lot of open access being published by the UK. But it's also true to say that there's never been more pessimism about open access from many of our UK stakeholders. I'm not saying all. I don't think I would include Dr. Paul Aris in that. <laughs> He's nodding. <laughs> but, but there is a little bit of that um, because there is a feeling that we've done an awful lot around open access. We, we really are doing that. But what has actually happened with the transition? We don't seem to have moved yet to this transition. There isn't any evidence of a whole-scale transition of subscription journals taking place. We know that titles do move to pure, full open access on an annual basis. Publishers do do that, but they are small numbers each year. You know, they have the big deal publishers, 2,000 titles, and maybe 19 go might transition to fully open access. So what we find really is that because articles are still being accepted in the usual way into the, the, the firewall part, the subscription part of a hybrid journal, and articles are being accepted into the open part of the same journal, that for publishers, for large publishers, it very much seems like it's business as usual. They're just doing the same thing, really. There is no change, as I tried to indicate earlier, in saying that actually, from the publisher side, these journals are going to transition. We are going to, you know, every year maybe we have um, 200 articles in this journal. We're going to keep that for the next year and the next year, and we're going to ensure that the open access component grows and grows, and the subscription part reduces and reduces. That isn't clear that publishers are, are, are doing that because of editorial policies, and then that goes back to the authors so who are involved in those decisions. So it's a bit of a cycle um, there. To, to, it's a bit of a challenge. And also, then, what are the appropriate offset models to constrain costs and make the transition? Our experience is telling us there isn't just one. Um, there isn't only one offset model to use. Publishers um, will have different types of models that we discuss and talk to them about. And actually, for some quite small publishers that don't, don't have much in the way of subscription revenue, um, an offset model isn't really going to work at all. But we know that that's, the focus really is on the big major publishers of um, the big deals. That's really where we need to put the focus. Um, that's what we need to, to do. So um, it wouldn't be desirable or suitable to prescribe any particular system, we think, which would necessitate a publisher applying a particular discounting model because you, for the different reasons around how publishers operate. So prepayment agreements or any arrangement which requires upfront payment can put institutions in the position of having to spend money with a publisher, something that cannot be guaranteed due to academic freedom uh, to make savings. So that's the exact opposite of what we're trying to achieve. And these comments have actually come through from the efficiencies group that I mentioned right at the beginning. These, these are things that the, the, pub, the librarians are saying. And the recipients of APC expenditure um, are the big ones. They get most of the AP, APC expenditure. And then there's a long tail at the bottom, all the other publishers who make up um, 43 million there 
Um, the challenge there is that all that money is going, the small amounts of money going to publishers, it's the administration of that is a barrier to transition as well. Um, so, you know, the top 10 publishers are making up 77% of the expenditure. The remaining 525 publishers in the data set here comprise the long tail. Um, but there are differences in the way those schemes or the APCs are actually managed and administered. So they may uh, depend on particular online approval tools or a prepayment scheme that works in this particular way and another one that works in this particular way. Or it could be unique voucher codes or retrospective discounts. And actually knowing that and how they all work is adding the costs. And, um, one of the most time intensive factors in managing gold open access is the setup required at each institution to enable payment and the recording of APCs and the subsequent investigation of payment issues. So the follow up, a bit like you did with the subscriptions, you know, I, th I have paid my subscription, oh I can't find that. It's the same thing with APCs but they're all they're much smaller amounts. So this kind of proliferation of schemes has presented challenges for institutions in fully understanding the administrative and real-term saving that each of the schemes might deliver. So the management costs associated with setting up offset agreements, decisions on how to implement offsetting within the institution, or advocacy and communication of deals to researchers are all a factor but are difficult to quantify. But at the same time, the labour costs of administering subscriptions are not insignificant. So it's, when you put it all together, it's keeping track of it and, and knowing what's going on. It's hugely time consuming. So I, just to reiterate again, I think I said it before, you know, OA funder mandates are about making articles open, not journals open. So paying for open access open access articles in hybrid journals doesn't mean that those journals will transition to fully open access. And you can see through the, the author's freedom of choice of where to publish that they are publishing in hybrid journals and nobody will tell them where to publish. It needs to come from that ground level understanding really that it's perpetuating a system by having the hybrid journals. In addition, those open articles are hidden within a mass of journals that are paid for in a big deal arrangement. There's no clarity to show which journals have the most UK authored articles in them or which journals have the most open articles in them. Uh, and as I said, publishers aren't proactively providing information about their policies to show at what point journals will flip to open access. So, Again, another diagram just showing the increase in costs of APCs. This is the average APC cost um, for various publishers, and, and you can see growing, going up. And just some statements that came out of um, our content strategy group, uh, sort of think tank around hybrid open access. Um, that hybrid open access entrenches primacy of prestige publishing. Hybrid open access entrenches the power of legacy publishers. Hybrid open access entrenches the subscription model. Hybrid open access perpetuates the opacity, opacity of the subscription model. Hybrid open access is more expensive than pure gold open access and hybrid open access is more costly to manage than pure gold open access. These are things that we have all understood about it. Why does Informa go down? Well, let me have a look, because I'm not seeing... So Informa is the yellow one here. Yeah. yeah um, they must have reduced their APC cost. But I'll check. I can find that out. I don't have the answer for you on Informa. Perhaps our Taylor and Francis colleague might know. Um, so, the consequences of the current approach, it can't lead to a transition to full open access. So it reinforces the association 
of gold open access with the payment of APCs, it, it incentivizes price rises for both subscriptions and APCs. And it entrenches the article as the primary unit of assessment. So what do we want to do? Um, we want to focus on agreements that support a transition. We want to move away from minor discounts on APCs. That's important to note. There's no point spending time on doing things for small peanuts. It's really focusing on those publishers, those types of agreements that really will make a difference. We want, we want to ensure that we include a, the addition of active service level agreements, focusing on workflows, making things transparent, making everything accountable. We have updated our JISC model license to accommodate this type of activity. Um, I just want to check how that, yeah, okay, apologies for that. Um, this is an example of how, just one page really, from our model license and the update, you can see things like access support hours, article metadata, embargo period, funder, gold root article, hybrid journal. These were all definitions that didn't exist before and they're now added in and we'll be using these in our agreements. And also the other side of the gold, of course, is green, and we have found that we have a number of our institutions that at a local level have policies for green open access over gold, and we're looking and seeking to work with our colleagues in JISC who have the router um, service. Uh, and so again, our agreements will tie in with router where that's appropriate to support green and we'll be able to provide a broader range of open access options and types of suppliers. That's what we're aiming to move away just from this journal way of uh, an APCs and take advantage of the new opportunities in collections management and discovery. So, in conclusion, there are some reasons for optimism. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I haven't quite finished. I would like to say I do have some reasons for optimism. <laughs> the nature of the discussions actually with the publishers over the past couple of years has become much more productive. I think everybody does realise that we are moving there, um, albeit maybe slowly, but that engagement is definitely there. Um, there's now a genuine exchange of, of views on these issues and a desire to move to the fully open access future. Um, in the context of the UK, open access is considered a given, so you know it's not going to go away and we don't want it to go away. Um, the government and the funders aren't going to turn their backs on it, but of course something may change around that in the future. We also um, are working with countries, for example we, do, we work a lot with ICOLC um, and consortia to see how we can work together and develop those approaches with the various publishers um, so that we can achieve as much open access as possible. But we do have to be realistic. It is really a significant challenge. It, we're on the journey. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's great that, that we can see the, the vision. And if everybody can hold on to that, then, you know, despite there's going to be a, a lot of effort, a lot of disruption and a lot of local action that we will be able to get there. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. So, so this was a very interesting uh, session. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, and we have a lot of time. <laughs> so uh, you are invited to or reflect, put a question, or please. Um, I would like to comment on some two things. First, there was an information that uh, providers actually don't compete. This is for me very significant information. You are from states, you know what this means. It means that uh, it means the increase of the price, absolutely inevitably. And then you mentioned when you presented those four reasons, or five, 
sorry, don't remember, uh, why uh, the paywall is still standing so strong. And one of the reasons uh, was that uh, authors and researchers are not keen very much to publish open access uh, area. So let's let's face the fact why. And I think it's very it's very obvious. Because otherwise they don't have all those scores and points for their promotion. And uh, until I guess we don't establish an alternative system with all that machinery of peer reviewing of scores, uh, impact factors, and everything, we cannot uh, ask authors and researchers to publish elsewhere, but uh, they will stay switched to the commercial publishers, so to say. So uh, I'm a bit surprised. I'm a, I must say I'm skeptical about this switch until we establish this alternative system. We have all means, we have uh, technology to establish, we have established repositories and so on. So the reason is why the repositories cannot compete with commercial publishers. Because we haven't established the machinery of peer reviewing and everything, all scores and points and everything that uh, researchers and authors and professors are interested in. Until we do so, we will stay with this uh, paywall, which will not go away, no matter how much efforts we uh, put into promoting open access for funds promoting open access and so on. But I would like to hear your comments about your optimism. Uh, where is it based on? Yeah. I would say that I fully agree with you that we need to think about changing the system for promotion and tenure in every in, in every country of the world. Um, I don't discount that at all. That is part of a, a broad open access strategy. I think um, for the moment there is academic freedom and so we want to allow our researchers to publish where they like. At my own, in, at my own organization, we will fund um, APCs for only gold open access um, publications. So that I mean that is definitely part of our strategy as well, trying to shift away from that power that the publishers have. Um, but I think the point is, um, I, I would perhaps simplify, but um, building onto institutional repositories, yes, why not? I mean, in, in or in, in a future world, I think it will look different. Um, we have technology today that we didn't have. And I think that it's a worthwhile investment to invest in university presses and repositories, whether they're institutional repositories or perhaps discipline repositories that are global. Maybe that's even the, 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 the proper direction to move in. However, those are long-term projects. And right now, we have the power to say no and, and stop. I mean, that it will take investment in, in to creating repositories. And where are we going to get that funding? And if we continue to foment the subscription system with, by paying subscription expenditures, I'm afraid we're never going to get there. That, that, I think this would be my ultimate message, is we've got to start taking the money out of the subscription system so that we can invest it in any number of other strategies. And I do agree with you. At the same time, we also need to change the way that we are evaluating our researchers and move it away from um, yeah, impact factor and other things. I agree with you 100% there. Well, um, a comment? comment? Yes, thank you. I, perhaps I could uh, add a, a comment to what uh, Colleen has said. I wanted, uh, I think the question uh, in part was how um, important is it uh, to change the evaluation systems at university level so that uh, researchers are rewarded for um, adopting open approaches. Well, in my university, we have just done this. We are probably the first university in Europe to have an academic promotions system, which 
sees openness for publication or for research data as a core requirement from uh, grade seven, which is the junior lecturer uh, grade, right through to professor, <coughs> which is grade 10. Uh, I inserted that in the uh, new academic promotions framework. It's an open access document. It's on the UCL uh, website. Uh, we went out to consultation with all the academics in UCL, well, which lasted a year, because we were making, we the institution, were making quite big changes <coughs> to the academic promotions framework. And we got hundreds of uh, comments uh, back from um, colleagues, and we had several special meetings of academic board, which is our academic senate, where acad any academic uh, in the university can put a question to the senior management in the university about any proposed change. And we had several meetings, uh, obviously, um, about the uh, promotions framework changes. Uh, the, as I say, there were hundreds of, of comments uh, in the uh, consultation about the changes that were made, there was not one single comment, uh, adverse comment, made about openness as a criterion that had been in explicitly introduced into the promotions framework. I attended each of these meetings because, uh, obviously, if there had been questions, I, as the author of those particular changes, would have had to enter into dialogue with uh, academics to discuss them. But no one uh, queried it, and, every, uh, and so it sailed through without any opposition. Uh, and the reason, uh, well, how did it do that? Uh, the, re the reason it, it, it didn't receive any opposition is that we, in the library, with our open access advocacy team, had been advocating for several years about the importance of open access and winning academics round two, meeting the funder requirements that UK funders have for open access uh, dissemination, particularly in uh, our research evaluation framework in REF uh, 2020. There, were, there is general acceptance. There isn't any serious opposition in UCL uh, to open access or uh, as, a, as a phenomenon in the publishing uh, arena. So once you've done your advocacy and you've won your academics over to the principal, you can then start making the second raft of changes in things like your uh, academic promotions framework to embed openness in the approach that you make. Uh, and that's what we've done in my institution. And as I say, all the documents are openly available on the website. Do, do, do have a look. Thank you. Any more questions? for all of you and uh, maybe for a few comments. Uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, first question is uh, for a short comment about uh, the current situation uh, which is in reality. I mean, um, you mentioned that you, you calculate the uh, 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 amount of APCs, that you do some bureaucratic investigation, etc. But uh, do you uh, analyze also, let's say, the uh, business reports of those uh, publishers. Why? Because uh, I mean, my opinion is that um, that uh, problems are revenues, and profits. Uh, since one, let's say, Elsevier case, and I, I have some data about uh, Elsevier for 2014. Since one Elsevier article. Uh, brings uh, 2,000 uh, pounds of clear profit uh, after paid taxes, and researchers which contribute uh, uh, knowledge, uh, content, are paid with uh, citations and with, uh, let's say, prestige only, and not with financial contribution. Uh, I mean, those financial contribution uh, in, in, within, let's say, uh, discounts with subscriptions for uh, for uh, 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 discounting subscriptions for next uh, 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 year uh, for institution. Uh, since that, I think that, that this this gap will be only bigger and bigger. I think that uh, you mentioned that uh, 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 that 
uh, revenues and uh, prices increase for 60% in, in 10 years. And we expect, as, as you mentioned, we expect uh, 25 in, in the next quarter. Uh, so my my concern is that since we we are I mean consortia libraries institutions we are focused only to keep uh, the revenues at the existing level and not to focus to change globally as uh, Billy said uh, a minute before to, to change glo uh, to change globally uh, 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 business model and also scholarly communication model. Since there, there will be, uh, my opinion is there will be a gap between uh, between wishes and uh, our, our possibilities uh, and between uh, uh, publisher expectations. In current situation, we have huge problem. Offset is more expensive than uh, current uh, subscriptions. It's true. Um, uh, publish and read model depends on structure of publishing. Our first calculation in Slovenia shows show that uh, it is very probably that uh, regarding the list price for APCs, those those amounts could be much higher than we are paying now for subscriptions. Uh, I would like to ask you for a short comment about, and also my question is also to Caroline and to, to you as well, what do you think about funding uh, uh, hybrid uh, uh, publications? Yeah, okay, uh, you mentioned uh, no. Uh, I would like to to, to hear a really clear statement about that because I think that funding hybrid we just prolong uh, this transition to uh, uh, to nowhere. Right? Uh, this is my opinion, but please correct me or confirm this. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, that's a lot of info. Though <laughs> that was a lot. Let me um, comment just a few a few points. Uh, um, so I mentioned before, yes, we do not support hybrid um, APCs. Uh, I want to say, just call out the economic principle that if we can achieve transparency in pricing, then we can have competition. And when you have competition, then it's more probable that costs will go down, pricing will go down. Right now we are living in a situation where we don't have enough transparency. This is why we have initiatives like the Open APC, um, right, so that we can achieve that transparency. I think for a consortium, um, yes, getting a handle on the data, or your publication data, is, is also good across publishers so you can have, um, develop a strategy that's not necessarily all publishers, you know, maybe maybe it makes sense to just start with one, and and already that is a step in the right direction, right? So I would invite you to think about that. It doesn't have to be a massive change. You have to do everything. Take one step at a time. I think also that um, we are in a danger right now of the the offset models or or the the these transitional agreements to becoming the new norm, and we want to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> And the way to avoid that and push beyond it is to have more um, libraries and consortia pushing this model. I also think that um, right now, I mean, if, if I mean, I know because you, I used to work for um, a, on the supply side. I used to work for JSTOR, and I know that there were discounting structures in place around the world, so that you know there were cost uh, subscription prices paid in in one country and they were different in another country. I don't know why. We, we couldn't have that logic in, in a world of publishing costs. It's, it's completely legitimate to think about something like that, I think. So, yeah, just, that was just a few of my comments, but Carolyn might have more to share. Um, well, firstly, just to address the hybrid one, um, I mean, I, I personally think um, we shouldn't be funding hybrid APC, you know, APCs in hybrid journals. That's my own personal opinion, because I do think that if, uh, I'm sure uh, lots of people think the same, I, I do think that if um, those articles weren't funded, then publishers would make decisions more quickly about transitioning to full open journals, and yeah, and it would change this con business as usual kind of uh, approach that's still going on. Just, just thinking of a, the global model, um, the way 
that we can look at moving to the global scenario is that if we look at the Springer Nature approach, they're really flipping the, what's happening in countries, those countries that are participating in the Springer Compact Agreement, it's more or less what's the revenue in that country now funds open access is the basic principle of it. So you could see you know, one transition to global open access as, as being what's already in the country now just transitions to paying for publishing instead and, and carving it up like that. Or you can, the, the real way of, of, I suppose, moving to open access is really following the scope three model where you are looking at the proportion of publishing output by country and, and moving things in that direction and then keeping your APC costs low um, as part of that process. But in, in that transition, it means that there will be winners and losers. There will be the countries that will always pay much more, like the UK. Um, <laughs> well, Thank you. well, we will. Um, and there will be those who pay a lot less, and you know, because they, they will see their subs they're, they're not paying as much for publishing as they're paying for their subscriptions. So you can see immediately that those countries, if they've done that calculation in their head, will be really ready to go to, for that change to open access because they will save money actually. And then there will be the others who will who who are going who know they will pay more. I mean that's fair because the model is different. The model is to pay to publish, but the UK has to bite the bullet on that and has to accept it and has to see that. Well, unless we can really keep that the APC rate really low to minimise that, yes, the UK will pay more. <laughs> Thank you. So, any more questions? Uh, Caroline, I like the way how you mentioned green way to open access, which, to, to my disappointment, it's kind of forgotten in the last years. Do you also this feeling that we are moving too much toward gold uh, uh, and forgetting that we have also something green? And green is supposed to be nicer than gold. Gold is money. It's gold, gold journals are money journals. I mean, whenever we think about it, it's that's just for publishers, for someone to make money. And green is something to be sustainable and nice. And uh, do you think that we can also work something in maybe loosening the embargo dates, uh, or maybe staying more? for in that direction? Um, well, I, I, can, I can say, I mean, just is supporting green. In, in our negotiations, we are covering off the green. Um, but I suppose how we work um, is that we support the government mandate. And so a certain proportion needs to be published uh, open access. And there are, there's, block funding for to help do that, universities can decide how they use their, their funding, but to actually meet the mandate, they do have to publish fully gold, mostly, to do that. Yeah, that's a great way of yeah. doing it. So, um, but as I say, Router is um, a GIST service that supports um, getting articles into repositories, so so yes, we, we are definitely addressing the green because we know we, we have to. You know, it's an alternative open access. Do you want to take that? So the question is, um, what more can we do on the green? Mm. On green? Yeah. Oh, because I know that the official policy of United Kingdom is gold. Mm. That's why I was referring to this question. Uh, well, the, the preference is for gold. Okay. But, but, but uh, Hefke, for example, the uh, research funder, would accept any color, well, in either color, green or gold. OK, there is, a, there is a movement in the UK, which we haven't talked about today, because it is just a UK movement, and this is a European workshop. But there is a... a, a You're little, still a Europe for... Uh, we are. <laughs> we'll always be in Europe. We might not always be in the community, but that's another, that's another meeting, unfortunately. Um, yes, so uh, there is a, a, a movement called the UK Scholarly Communications Licence, 
which is being um, pursued uh, by my colleague uh, Chris Banks, who is Director of Library Services and Assistant Provost in Imperial College in London. Uh, and because of UK copyright law, uh, Chris is advocating uh, that academics give their institutions a non-exclusive license to the uh, final author accepted manuscript of a publication, a paper, or a monograph before the copyright is assigned to a publisher when it's being published through the commercial route. Uh, if that were to be accepted as <coughs> practice, and it is only under discussion at the moment, no one has adopted it, uh, it would be a way of avoiding embargoes because the UK scholarly communications license would take precedence over the assignment of copyright because the assignment of copyright is over the published version, not about the author accepted manuscript. And if the academic has given the institution a non-exclusive license, it would mean that the repository or the library that's running the repository would be able to take uh, the final author accepted manuscript with all the peer review points addressed in the manuscript and load it straight away in the repository. Uh, it is under discussion in the UK. It isn't policy yet, but it would, if it were adopted, it would go some way to change the status of the types of material in repositories, because the, the version of record might no longer be simply the published output, but could be the green version that's under the deposited in the repository under the uh, UK scholarly communications license. So, if we come back in a year's time. Uh, it's just going to be here for another workshop. We'll be able to tell you whether the UK SCL has worked or not, or whether it's just been a discussion point which hasn't been adopted. Very good. I think it should be adopted elsewhere. Because right. Well, what, Slovenian scholarly communications license would yeah, be a very nice, would be thing, nice to thing to do. Yeah. yeah. And we are a small country, we can afford it. But what <laughs> I'm afraid with the gold, uh, uh, gold access is because. The, okay, the subscription mo model, we are not satisfied with that, but it still keeps the quality. We still have the top 10% of the quality <coughs> journals. And these journals, because they are not based on them, they are out of capitalism in a way. They are not based on money, because they can afford to publish only 10% or 20% of the papers which are given to them. They can afford to be choosy. But if you, are, if you are using a gold way, you are not afford to be choosy. We know problem with PLOS, which is not, which is not very public, but we know what they do. They, they cannot afford anymore to say, no, we are not going to publish them, especially also in other journals. If you, if you say, no, I'm not going to publish this article because of the quality, I'm losing money. So if we turn everything to gold, there will be no criteria anymore. You, we are going to publish too much. We already are publishing too much here. That's a problem, scientific information, which we are not going to discuss, I know. But now we have too many journals. We have too many papers. We have too many publications. We have too many journals, uh, publish only journals, which no one reads. They just publish papers. And OK, predatory journals are the other extreme. But they are just, you know, be fair, but predatory journals are a side effect of open access. And that's something bad. That's we, no, we, I, I know, I know you are, I see that you are a zealot, so you will not be a very, very keen to, to listen to me. But this is, this is the same, and that's capitalism. That's what I'm afraid of. Because, okay, the, there's a rip off by the big publishing company. I know, we all know that. But still, we have a quality. I know if some journal is in the 10% of the best journals in the field, either by Impact Factor or by SNP or Simago or everything, I know this is a good journal. This is really because they published only 10% of the articles they receive. And if I see a pure gold journal, I'm not sure about what they are publishing. That's, that's what I'm afraid in the future, that we say we are against the capitalism, we are against the market, but actually what we are doing, we are supporting this market. We are doing another model. This is very, uh, very strange and very dangerous path. So please do not take me. I'm maybe older generation, but uh, 
I'm afraid that uh, we are not uh, cautious enough, that there are still some very dangerous things ahead of us. What we, yes, we, we should change the way how we uh, evaluate publication, evaluate pub, uh, professors and researchers and so on. But to not do that uh, on that way, we can say, OK, don't publish us. Don't use salami. You know what salami effect when you have one research and then you cut it in 10 base thesis and publish 10 papers. We should stop that, but not publishing in personal journals. Because I, I remember Pax Planck Initiative have spoken something of it out because you did mention that. I've got a lot, just, uh, if, I, if I've understood correctly. So you're saying, um, so the green open access road, though, is currently dependent on on journals published by these publishers present mm -hmm. here. And so you think that is something that we should support green and continue to work with these publishers who provide sort of an aggregation of quality content. Is that what, is that what you're yes, saying? Yes, but of course to go off the big news, big news. Uh, well, okay. I, I, agree with that. I mean, I have to say, uh, my, I have colleagues at the Max Planck Digital Library who, who would respond to you saying, indeed, the, the, the big publishers are providing a good service. These journals they have are quality journals. And we need to, um, and we don't want to disband them or destroy them. And in fact, the OA 2020 initiative does not aim to destroy those journals, okay? What we're trying to do is take control over the costs, which we can only achieve, we think, through an open payment model, which may not be an APC. Right now we're talking about APCs, but in the future we might talk about different forms of payment. I'd like to have a standing point, and I hope I'm not upsetting anybody here. And I'd like to, 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 to observe this uh, beautiful exercise of capitalism, which we live today now. This, uh, this event is put in place uh, by a private company, which we are, guilty for that, um, with the support of publishers, most of them uh, supporting the variety, the uh, diversity of, uh, of uh, open access models. Um, and it's a capitalist, uh, capitalist exercise. And I, my, my personal opinion is that uh, capitalists can be good. And it's, it's bringing uh, opportunities and events like this. Uh, I, 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 I want to have this standing point, and I, I, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I'm having now a suicidal action. <laughs> I, I will know, in, uh, I will be in, uh, not welcome in, in Slovenia anymore, or uh, none of we'll these uh, lovely speakers will continue to, <laughs> to come to our events. But what I don't want to see is to have a, a new color in, a, in the landscape of open access and open science, and to, that color to be the red color, the color of, uh, of uh, communists. Mm -hmm. So I think here we are in the right place, in a, a formal communist country, where people fought for, being capi for having the right to, to have a capitalist exercise, and to, to have the good part of the capitalism, which is bringing progress, which is recognizing the adding value, and which is, is, is giving a chance to people to stand out by perfecting their skills, by acquiring uh, these skills, in a, of course, in an uh, equitable way, in a, in a, in, in a way in, in, which, in which everybody has the same style. Why I'm saying this, because in a, uh, in a previous workshop, uh, it was a, another standing point coming from ETH Zurich, if, I, if, I, if I'm not wrong, Suggesting that all the talks around the around the open access, open science, may be talks that are encouraging socialism going back. So what I want to say is that I I I, I, I do appreciate a lot what 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 you said that uh, having um, uh, having a, uh, yes having a, 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 a cap capitalism is also a way of making sure that we ensure equality. And my standing point is that. Yes, we do need to understand that we, we have to, 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 to give a chance to competition, and we have to understand that open access can work, but nowhere being in a, a, a socialist or communist movement in any sense. So I, I don't, please don't take me wrong. I didn't understand that you said that. I just wanted to make sure that this is not a forum for, 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 for such things.
I have to do it directly. Uh, you are very wrong. You don't know very much about Slovenia, unfortunately. Uh, we were never communists. Uh, and uh, I was, I, when I started my career, professional career in 1980s, we, we already had an extremely well subscription model. Our, in Slovenia, we had a special funds which guaranteed all the research uh, libraries, university libraries, a special fund to getting journals, important uh, international journals in science. We got a special fund, I was, you have to know that. So this is, oh, every year, every year, every year. We had a special fund, which was called the research agency. I had a special fund for that, that was every year. I was head of library when you were a student, you know that. You should, I, I know that. You should know, you, you get your library. So this is, uh, you are completely wrong, and I must say that uh, you should, read a little bit of Slovenian history that uh, this was now. So subscription mo model was very good for Slovenia because we all, we, we, our researchers were the people who asked for the government. They said, otherwise, if you don't get us all the best journals, we want to do a good research. And they, they do it. And they, we still have this. We have still Slovenia, a special fund, which is uh, financing the subscription model for the best uh, company. So this model is still here. I, I, I just say that, of course, this is, <laughs> I just say that we want to preserve quality. But I supported your point. No? I didn't contradict you. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry. We have to finish because we are in the coffee. And sometimes we uh, do tomorrow one dialogue, so I invite you uh, to continue and we see each other in 20 minutes back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.